My name is Giancarlo Corsetti. I'm Pierre Werner Chair at the European University Institute. And today I have the privilege to chair this uh, Buffy lecture, the 16 Buffy lecture. I think it's appropriate to remember that the Buffy series, Buffy lecture series, was conceived to honor Governor Buffy, reflecting both the depth and in the scholarly writing on the themes of money and finance, but also his firm beliefs, his firm belief in the need to deepen our understanding of the subtle interconnection between money and finance and the relevance for the economy and society via theoretical and uh, applied analysis. Going through the past records of the lecture, uh, you can appreciate uh, the impressive achievement fully in line with this uh, uh, statutory goal. I have to confess that I'm biased. I have a, a long time academic close friendship with the bank. And I have to say that the lecture also reflects the style and work class quality of the analysis and research done here at the bank, really uh, uh, hard to match in other institutions, even when research from the bank work away from Rome. Today's lecture is delivered by Professor Annette Wissing Jorgensen on convenience yield and monetary policy. Uh, I have to say that the prestigious career of Professor Wissing Jorgensen, uh, apart from being invaluable, is a, an example of the high returns from a close integration of scientific interest with policy making work. Currently professor at, the, at Berkeley at the Haas Business School after appointment at Northwestern and Chicago. It has been many years since 2001 that uh, Annette has been uh, serving as a senior advisor, research and policy at the Division of Monetary Affairs at the Fed Board. So there is, in her production, which is intense and prestigious, you can see the close two-way dialogue between Annette as a scholar and Annette as a Fed person. Uh, in particular, you can appreciate the systemic exploration of the architecture, or I should call the inner plumbing of our modern monetary system where many assets share the same characteristic of safety and moneyness with what we once called the monetary base. This is in terms of high valuation, commanding a safety and a liquidity premium, as well as in terms of non-pecuniary return, non-pecuniary benefits that we now dub convenient yield, the topic of the lecture today. I introduced the lecture with three sentences. The first one is that the architecture and the inner plumbing of our monetary system has proved to be resilient to the large shocks that in the last year, years, financial real shocks have hit our economies. You may actually argue that because of this resilience, we, we survived these shocks, containing the cost in terms of economic and social disruption. But we cannot take this resilience for granted, and we cannot downplay the need to manage it. The, to manage it. And this is, I think, is the best introduction to Annette's lecture today, one of the many reasons why we should listen carefully and try to uh, draw lessons and uh, inspiration. And uh, we have one hour and uh, questions at the end. It's a great honor to be invited to give this lecture at such a distinguished. I have another microphone, let me go. It's a great honor to be invited to give the Buffy lecture, uh, such a distinguished lecture at such a distinguished institution. Look around, it's a little bit intimidating, but I'll give it my best shot. So in today's lecture, I wanna talk about convenience shield and how they relate to monetary policy. If you wouldn't mind pulling up the slides, that would be great. So I was given instructions to speak to a very smart, person who may not be working in monetary policy day to day. So I'm gonna go a little slow at the beginning, going through some of the basic moving parts. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we'll get into some of the, the more specifics and, and everyone will learn something along the way, even those who work in monetary policy from day to day. So let me start by defining what I mean by convenience yield. So if you think of us as investors, we care about expected returns and risk on our investments. If we think about investing in bonds or the fixed income investments, the returns come from the interest payments and the principal payments. However, there could be another return to us as investors, which is a convenience yield. 
And so by a convenience shield, I simply mean a return above and beyond the obvious cash flows. And you can think of this as a cost savings from investing in one particular kind of asset rather than another one. So for example, the convenience yield could come from the liquidity. Think of cash. Um, you have saved transaction costs in using this particular asset to do your business relative to other less liquid assets. Uh, the convenience yield could also come from safety. If you think about, you know, why do people buy U.S. treasuries or German bonds? It's because the default risk is partly because the default risk is very low. So it's an uncomplicated investment. You don't have to expend a lot of resources doing complicated credit risk analysis. Both of these elements, the liquidity and the safety underlying convenience yields, interact with regulations. Um, as you know, banks are subject to lots of regulations in terms of both how many reserves they need to hold and also in terms of how much liquidity they have to hold more broadly, for example, under the liquidity coverage ratio, and they may value holding particular assets to satisfy these requirements. All right, so convenience shields, of course, are at the heart of monetary economics. In fact, you could define money as something that has a convenience yield. And so I think the, the sort of surprising uh, component of this to me is that there's a lot more going on than you might think. You know, if you take undergraduate macro, you see sort of your, uh, your money demand supply diagram, and it seems relatively straightforward. But then you start digging into the whole central bank balance sheet, and there's a whole bunch of different assets and liabilities, many of whom have their own convenience shield. And so uh, what I'd like to do in today's lecture is to talk you through a series of papers of mine that I'll reference at the end. Um, to kind of describe how convenience yield drives traditional central banking of trying to hit this short market interest rate, but also the newer central banking in the form of quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. And as you'll see, uh, there's going to be many different convenience yields going on along the way. So as I said, I want to start out with some basics just for those who might be from a different field of economics. And then we'll dig into talking specifically about two convenience yields. Uh, one is the one on banks checking accounts with the central banks. That's what reserves are. Uh, I'm going to try to describe how that convenience yield describes the demand for reserves, which it turns out is going to be crucial for both standard monetary policy, how to actually hit the short term interest rate, as well as quantitative tightening, which is the act of reducing the size of the balance sheet. That's what we are in and now, both in the Federal Reserve System as well as at the ECB. Then I want to switch gears a bit and talk about a different convenience yield, uh, namely that on U.S. treasuries. So that's going to take us from the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet, where we have the reserves, to the asset side, where we have a lot of treasuries. And I'm going to argue that uh, when there's a convenience yield on treasuries, that's going to matter for how you best do quantitative easings. I'll skip the details until I have introduced everyone to the moving parts so you can appreciate the results better. Finally, I'm going to make an argument that in the current environment of quantitative tightening, it could actually make sense to equalize the two convenience yields. But now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Okay, so let's start with the basics. So if you look at a central bank balance sheet, uh, on the asset side, you have securities and loans to banks as the largest categories. The Federal Reserve historically holding most of the securities, the ECB historically uh, holding predominantly loans to banks. The way that the central banks pay for these assets, you know, it's like any other bank, you need some funding. And the liabilities are currency, so cash, uh, as well as two different kinds of deposits. Uh, one being government deposits with the central bank, the other being banks deposits with the central bank. Those are the ones called reserves. Now, all those liabilities are types of money. They're all very liquid, they're all very safe. And I have laid out sort of the reasons why people are willing to hold these assets, as we'll see at, at low returns. It's because the liquidity and safety means you can do something with these assets that you couldn't have done at the same cost with other assets. So, for example, when you use currency to pay for your groceries, that is easier than trying to trade your services, you know, for groceries as you would in an old fashioned barter system. Um, and then for, as for the government deposit and the bank deposit with the central bank, uh, 
you know, that works the same way as your own deposits. You're willing to take a low interest rate on your checking account. You may have noticed that that rate is still pretty low despite the fact that the ECB has raised interest rates substantially. You're still willing to hold your checking account as is the government and the banks because you are earning these liquidity and safety services. All right, so let's think about the demand for money, the supply of money, and then we can get into central bank policy. So starting with the demand for money, I'm going to first talk about this very general. We'll have one simple expression that will carry over in many of the latest slides. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to denote the convenience value, value of money, where money could be currency, bank deposits, whatever. I'm going to call that by V for value. It's going to be a function of how much money you hold. And it turns out that uh, for money and say policy, a key uh, element here is going to be how that value changes when you hold more money. So this is the formally the first derivative of this function with respect to money. That's going to, as we go through different kinds of money, be different arguments showing up. But for now, let's just focus on the role of the money. OK, so now think about the demand for money. Uh, what's optimal for the holder is to keep holding money until you have equalized the return on money including the convenience yield, with the return on whatever else you could hold. Okay, so in other words, in equation one uh, shown, uh, at the margin, you're going to equalize these returns. In other words, because the convenience yield on money is positive, you're going to be willing to hold money, even if the immediate return on money is quite low. Thus, the argument about your checking account. Uh, and you're willing to do this because you're holding something that also pays the convenience yield. It's a little bit less visible, but nonetheless something that you appreciate. So we can graph this out. It's going to look like any other demand function. Um, the variable on the y-axis now is the return on non-money assets, the other stuff you could hold instead of holding money in your checking account. And on the x-axis is the quantity of money. And like any other demand curve, it slopes down. In this case, it's because the convenience yield of money gets smaller and smaller because you may not actually need that extra money, and so you value it less and less. But other than that, it looks the same as a demand curve for milk or whatever. It's a downward sloping function. The level here depends on the interest rate on money, which is zero for currency, but could be positive on your bank deposits, could be positive on banks' reserves held at a central bank. And the asymptote uh, will then be the interest rate on money, you're going to be the asymptote if the money demand eventually is saturated. OK, so that was the demand for money. And uh, what about the supply of money? So let's focus on the central bank supply of these different kinds of money that I laid out before. If you think about the central bank's mandate, there's typically three parts to it. The first part is that the central bank is supposed to facilitate the payment system, make sure the economy is working. And it does that by supplying money that has a convenience yield that facilitates trade. A secondary and, of course, very important objective is monetary policy, which could either be focused only on inflation or on both inflation and growth. The mandate varies across central banks. A third important mandate is financial stability. You can think of the lender of last resort function as falling in that category, as well as the supervision and regulation. So a typical approach for how central banks manage all these different things all at the same time is to say, we are going to supply reserves. Remember, that's banks, deposits with the central bank. We're going to supply those for monetary policy objectives to hit the target. And then the other liabilities, the currency, the government deposits, they're going to supply elastically. So for example, when you go to the ATM, you can take out as much cash as you want. If the, similarly, if the government wants to hold more funds with the central bank, generally it can. The central bank accommodates that. So for that reason, the currency and the, and the government deposits are usually referred to as the autonomous factors because they're outside the control of the central bank. You could think of the central bank supply curve just being flat and the demand being determined by the going interest rate and the central bank just accommodating. Okay, so I've talked about the demand for money, the supply of money. So now we can get into some of the specifics, focus on two different kinds of money-like assets, namely uh, reserves and treasuries. So starting with reserves, uh, we're going to do the whole money demand expression one more time with the specifics 
for this kind of money, namely reserves. So now I'm going to I put out a, I put up a different balance sheet. Before I had one for the central bank. Now I have one for a regular bank, and that's why the reserves now have moved to the other side of the balance sheet. Right? So for the banks, that it's an asset for the central bank. It's a liability. Uh, the other components should look familiar. And for thinking about banks' demand for reserves, there's four features that are particularly pertinent. First, reserves may pay interest. Um, they may uh, also be needed to satisfy reserve requirements. That varies. The Fed currently has no reserve requirements. The CECB still has. Um, and then importantly, reserves have these liquidity or convenience benefits. In the specific case of reserves, the reason that the reserves are useful is because you, the depositors, may decide to withdraw deposits. And then the advantage to the bank of having reserves is that they can immediately satisfy your withdrawal without first having to sell securities or cut back on lending. And so the, the, our little convenience value function now will be a function of reserves, specifically of uh, excess reserves above and beyond any reserve requirement. And now starting to fill in the other arguments, you can see that deposits will be a key determinant of how useful reserves are. Uh, in particular, our convenience yield function V prime, uh, the margin value of money is going to be decreasing in how, how much money as before, but now increasing in how many deposits there are to manage for the simple reason that having a dollar more reserves is more useful if you have more potential deposit outflows to manage. The final component I want to mention is that banks generally face a balance sheet cost, um, in this case, for growing their balance sheet to hold reserves. Uh, that's a shortcut here for... Um, for capital requirements, which actually then, you know, if you ask a bank, what is the balance sheet cost, they'll say equity is expensive. And I'm going to capture that in, in reduced form here with a little fee variable. Uh, but this actually also comes back to convenience yield, because from the perspective of banks, they can raise funds cheaply through deposit funding, because deposits have convenience yield to us, you know, the holders, uh, as opposed to equity, which generally don't appeal to convenience investors. Okay, so now... We're going to repeat the same money demand expression that we had before, just filling in the specifics of the reserves market. Um, so the bank, think about the bank trading off holding reserves as an asset versus other assets. Here, for specificity, let's make the other assets interbank lending. You could do securities, loans, whatever. This one, it turns out to be the easiest to take to the data. Um, so then remember, we, the, at the margin, the holder of money, now the bank, is going to equalize the return on non-money here into bank lending with the return on money, which is the interest rate on, on reserves plus the convenience yield. So same expression from before, just with some specifics. Now, this first order condition is going to hold for a bank that actually both holds reserves and does interbank lending. Uh, as you may know, the interbank market has uh, become a lot less active with large central bank balance sheet. It turns out that both in the U.S. as well as in the euro area, banks tend to actually be borrowing in the interbank market from non-banks who may not have access to the central bank balance sheet. And therefore, the more relevant first order condition is actually this, the equation three here, where, this, where the, the banks uh, borrow from non-banks in order to hold reserves. And what that does is that it uh, enters the little balance sheet cost fee in here because now the bank is not just reallocating between different kinds of assets for give, given balance sheet size, but actually borrowing from someone else to grow its balance sheet size. So equation three will be the main equation that we're going to use for the uh, actual implementation. So now repeating then the money demand picture with the specifics of the reserves market, the interest rate on money now will be the interest rate on reserves. Um, because there's this balance sheet cost, the asymptote is a little bit lower. But other than that, everything works out the same as before. Um, and just to start introducing you to some of the lingo of monetary policy, uh, when central bankers talk about scarce reserves, what they mean is that the central bank is operating on a pretty steep part of the reserve demand curve. When they talk about ample reserves, um, they mean that you are on a part that is still some slope, but it's not flat, and then abundant reserves is when you're on the flat part. So if you, if you look at this diagram, you can see that it's actually easier to be a central banker than you might have thought in terms of hitting the monetary policy target. Uh, 
which is the target for the variable on the y-axis, the short maturity market interest rate. And the reason it's easier than you might have thought is because not only can the central bank control the supply reserves, it can also control the demand. The way it does that is it changes the, the attractiveness of the reserves by changing the interest rate on the reserves. So you can see if you wanted to hit a given interest rate on the y-axis, you could either set a low interest rate on reserves, the demand would be low, you would do a low supply, or you could set a high interest rate on reserves, demand would be high and you would have a, need to have a higher supply. And so I've illustrated this with points A and B. Point A here would correspond to a scarce reserves regime and point B to what's called an ample reserves regime. So thinking about which regime central banks uh, have actually chosen, you could think of what's called an operating framework in central bank lingo as simply a choice of whether you want to work with a high convenience yield and reserves or a low convenience yield and reserves. So before the financial crisis, the Fed operated with very scarce reserves. In fact, it set the interest rate and reserves to zero. It didn't have the authority to pay interest on reserves. And um, the convenience yield uh, was very high. I've illustrated that with a very low uh, supply here needed to hit a given interest rate target. Post the financial crisis, the Fed is paying interest rate on reserves. The ECB has always been able to pay interest rate on reserves. Before uh, the financial crisis operated with somewhat scarce reserves, around 100 basis point of reserve scarcity. Uh, and both central banks have, as they have done more and more balance sheet expansion through quantitative easing, have moved the supply to the right and is, are now operating with ample reserves. So thinking about what exactly is the central banker supposed to do in order to conduct policy, let's contrast the two regimes and let me focus on the two Fed regimes. So in the first regime with scarce reserves uh, and in a zero interest rate on reserves, the first thing to do is to set supply so it intersects demand at the interest rate you're targeting. Then if you change the target, to affect inflation or growth, you need to change the supply, but not much because you're operating on that steep part of the demand. So you can see very small shifts in supply will be enough to move the interest rate. What else you're supposed to do? Well, if the reserve demand shifts, you need to shift supply so you still hit the target. And then the more subtle part is what are you supposed to do if these autonomous factors, that was the currency and the government deposits, if they change, well, then you can see from the, the central bank's balance sheet that if you didn't take any action, if the assets were the same, but autonomous factors were bigger, reserves would shrink, which would mess up you hitting your target. So what you need to do is when autonomous factors grow, you need to grow the assets to keep the reserves constant. But so that's how monetary policy is done in the scarce reserve regime. By contrast, think about the new or the ample reserves regime. Here, the supply of reserves is determined by something else, namely quantitative easing and quantitative tightening. So the way that you now are gonna hit the, the target is not by changing the supply, but by changing demand. And the way you change demand is by moving the interest rate on reserves as illustrated. So what are you supposed to do to con conduct monetary policy? The same, similar steps to before, but now you set the interest rate on reserves to hit the target. If demand shifts, you change the interest rate on reserves to still hit the target. Uh, there's less need to uh, keep track of these autonomous factors because if there is a slight change in reserve supply, it's not gonna lead to very large fluctuations in the interest rate. The key thing, which is getting a ton of attention now, both at the Fed and the ECB is, you need to make sure you know where you hit the point of curvature. And so that's a, something that's discussed a ton in the concept of extra balance sheet shrinkage or quantitative tightening. Because once you hit that point, now changes in autonomous factors will start changing interest rates a lot and that could lead to a loss of you hitting the target. Okay, so now we need to put this into practice. And so in work with David Lopez Salido at the Fed, we have tried to estimate reserve demand for the purposes of items one, two, and three that I just laid out. And so this, it turns out, uh, actually to be relatively straightforward. We assume a functional form for the convenience shield that it's locked linear in excess reserves and deposits and plug it into that same first order condition that I have shown you a bunch of times. 
Uh, there's one thing which is a little bit subtle, which is, can you just estimate this using a regular regression? The answer is actually no, because I have cheated a little bit when I do the supply curve as vertical. In practice, uh, you may know the central banks will have standing facilities at which they stand ready to add more reserves when needed. In the U area, that would be the marginal lending facility. At the Fed is a discount window. Uh, they also, at the Fed, we stand ready to lower reserve supply um, if that's needed to prevent interest rates from going too low. So the way that the reserve demand, the reserve supply curve, sorry, looks is actually not entirely vertical. There's a flat part at the top and the bottom. And when you want a flat part, shift in demands will shift the equilibrium amounts of reserves that causes endogeneity. So what you do is you basically, in econometric terms, you instrument reserves with the, the total uh, sum of reserves plus, in this case, in the Fed case, this overnight reverse repo facility, which is basically reserves for non-banks. With the idea is that the sum of those two is driven by how much QE or QT you're doing, not by reserve demand shocks, whereas the split between the two could be driven by demand shocks. So long story short, you end up estimating a really simple relation where you relate the spread between the short-term money market interest rate here, the Fed funds rate, and the interest rate in reserves to a measure of central bank supply. This is the reserves plus these overnight reverse repos and deposits. And at first, when you graph this out, it's kind of a disaster, as you can see in the left picture. If you just graph the spread against supply, it doesn't look much like a demand curve. It's more like a Christmas garland that somebody's pulling up the tree. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not a big problem in that we know what's pulling on the Christmas garland. It's just a simple fact that over time, the banking sector is growing. So it's demand for reserve growth. So proxying that by deposits, uh, you can see the fitted relation in the right picture where I'm plotting on the x-axis now something slightly different, which is supply adjusted for the need for supply uh, measured by deposit. And you can see we get a quite nice negative relation. So this is a simple summary of what is the demand for reserve. Well, there it is. So now we can get back to what was our task as monetary policy makers. So we're in an ample reserves regime. We're trying to hit a certain target. For the sake of concreteness, let's suppose we're trying to hit a 4% interest rate target. So we're trying to make the short market rate clear at 4%. So what we'll do is we'll take that same equation that I have shown you now many times, the reserve demand, and we have already estimated the coefficients. And the other thing we know is we know how big the banking sector is now. We know what the deposits are. We can put in today's deposits. And then we can simply trace, we can trace out the predicted value of the spread as a function of central bank supply. And that's the picture uh, to your left. And so now, Thinking about our desire to hit a 4% interest rate, you can see that if we, as a central bank, have a really small balance sheet, that's going to be a high spread. That means that we're going to need to lower the interest rate on reserves quite a lot in order to allow for there to be some room for the spread up to the 4% target. So that's illustrated in the right picture, which shows how should the central bank set the interest rate on reserves as a function of the size of its balance sheet to hit its target. Conversely, if you have a large balance sheet, well, then the spread is lower and you need to set your interest rate and return higher. Okay, so this is a big deal in the current setting because both at the Fed and the ECB, we're shrinking our balance sheets. And if we didn't adjust our IORs, eventually the shrinkage is going to be so big that we're not hitting the target. So this is, we think, sort of the first empirically estimated version of this curve that hopefully policymakers can sort of use in real time saying, okay, guys, we need to hit our target we need to change the setting of the IOR. The other thing, let me skip that one. The other thing that gets a lot of attention in the context of quantitative tightening is this issue of at how low supply do we start seeing a lot of curvature in demand? And the reason that's getting so much attention is because the last time we did QT, it didn't end so well. So uh, the black line here is the total size of the Fed's balance sheet. It goes up a lot more than it goes down. There's been a lot more quantitative easing or balance sheet growth and balance sheet contraction. We do have that episode in 2018, 2019, where we contracted the balance sheet, and now we have the current one where we're contracting 
But the last time what happened was that Visto started getting scarce in the sense that there was, there was so few reserves that a small shock to supply induced by a switch in these autonomous factors made the market interest rate clear very high. Uh, the red lines here are market interest rates, the blue are the interest rate and reserves. In the left picture, you can see slightly that the, the short rate actually went outside the Fed's target range, and especially the short market rates in the repo market ended up with a huge spike. And there's lots of articles you may have read in Bloomberg or the Financial Times where market participants are worried that this same thing will happen again. So accordingly, there's lots of attention inside central banks trying to figure out where do we get a lot of curvature. And uh, fortunately, we can use that same very simple reserve demand estimation to speak to this. So this left part is the same you have already seen. I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to use it to now figure out at what level of supply is the market as tight as it was in September 2019. That would, from an interest rate volatility perspective, would be probably the lowest you would want to go in your quantitative tightening. And I estimate a number, we estimate with David Novoselito, a number of about 2.7 trillion in reserve plus or NRP, quite a lot lower than the current value, implying that the Fed has many months of, uh, of QT to go before there's likely to be any issues. All right, so that was a convenience yield on reserves. Uh, let me sw switch gear a bit and talk about the convenience yield on treasuries and how that relates to monetary policy. So remember after the financial crisis, central banks lowered interest rate to zero. The economies were still weak, and so we needed to do more to stimulate the economy. We couldn't do it by running interest rates very negative because if interest rates were very negative, people would just hold cash, banks would just hold cash. So for that reason, central banks around the world started doing more of this quantitative easing, which is just a fancy word for buying a whole bunch of long maturity bonds. That was done because the long interest rates had not already hit zero. So it turns out that for assessing how to do QE, convenience yields are also very important. So to convince you of that, I need to talk you through uh, one pretty simple expression here for how is a long interest rate actually determined. And then we can start thinking about how quantitative easing will work its way through these various terms. Okay, so in general, the interest rate on a long maturity bond will be a function of your expectations for the interest rates on short maturity bonds over the investment period, because you could either hold the long bond or you could roll over a series of short bonds. So as an investor, you're gonna trade those things off. Okay, so that is the blue term on the right-hand side. But long bonds generally are riskier than short bonds. Uh, if you have lived through the recent experience and you have a bond mutual fund, you will know that it pretty much tanked when central banks started raising interest, uh, started raising interest rates um, just by present value, you're discounting the same promised cash flows at a higher interest rate. Okay, so that's captured by the duration risk component in red. And as we'll see for different uh, types of uh, bonds, there can be other components that I'll talk through. Okay, so how does QE work? It works through both channels. So in terms of the first channel, when QE changes the long rate by moving the first component, that's generally called the signaling channel. And when it changes the long rate by moving the VAT component, that's called the portfolio rebalancing channels. And each term is relatively straightforward. In fact, the first term, you kind of already know how it works because we have already discussed how is a short rate determined in equilibrium. We had our reserve demand, the reserve supply. So you already know that if you are supplying more reserves as you need to, to fund quantitative easing, well, then the short rate is gonna be lower. Remember the demand curve is sloping down. And so more reserves makes the blue term smaller. That's a signal in general. The portfolio rebalancing uh, works a little bit different depending on which bond it is because there's these other components that can differ. So I've written out the expression for three different kinds of bonds, treasuries, so US government bonds, corporate bonds, and mortgage-backed securities. And, um, for example, if you look at the corporate bond, obviously there could be some default risk on the corporate bond. Uh, 
if you look at the treasuries. Importantly, I'm going to argue that treasuries are money like a bit like currency and reserves because they're very liquid and very safe. So there's going to be a convenience shield that's going to drag down the interest rate at which we, people are willing to hold treasuries because they also earn the convenience shield, going back to our very first slides on money. Okay, so now I should say that I have work. Uh, I'm going to describe my work on USQE here. I also have some work on the ECB's QE, and there there's extra terms. Uh, you may be, remember the whole issues of the Italian uh, credit default swaps going up. There's some issue of sovereign default. There's also the whole issue of the breakup of the euro area. I'm going to just refer you to, the, to that other paper to keep things reasonably straightforward uh, with these expressions here. All right, so now let's try to figure out whether quantitative easing, you know, how, it, how does it work? Which part is moving? And in particular, the thing that's of concern is, suppose that the Federal Reserve just started buying a bunch of treasuries, then they might just make treasuries scarcer, driving up the price of treasuries. That may not do much for all of us. You know, we, you know, as private sector borrowers, as households, as firms, we may not benefit much by the Federal Reserve lowering the borrowing costs for the, for, for the government. So importantly, if this change in the Treasury convenience yield is a key transmission channel for QE, then you probably should buy something else in QE to lower the private sector's borrowing cost the most. Okay, so let's see if we can work this out. Okay, so if you, if you uh, have followed the prior discussions of convenience yields, uh, let, me, let me just, though, you always sort of have a good sense of what is the convenience yield and treasury, but just since uh, this is so important, let me just give you one more graph to give you some intuition for what it is. And then we'll try to sort out those equations for the bond yields and think about how QE is, is working. So here I have a graph of bond yields against default risk. And of course, you would expect this to be upward sloping. That's why the you know, Italian bond yields are higher than you know, lower risk uh, countries, uh, borrowing rates. Uh, yeah. So uh, thinking about uh, how a convenience yield would show up in this picture, it tends to show up as ultra safe bonds plotting, quote unquote, too low. Okay, so I illustrated here with treasuries, but I could have done German bonds instead or Dutch government bonds. So in other words, if you think about the yield spread between a corporate bond and a treasury, it's not just default risk stemming from the corporates. It's also this moneyness from the treasuries. So to decompose those two, uh, in a paper with Arvind Krishnamurti in the JPE, we said you can actually decompose the, the spreads into those two components by just remembering that if treasury is money or money demand slopes down, you should get a downward sloping relation. Okay, so the main picture from that paper is this one here, where basically you can estimate the default component as the spread for large supply, and then the rest is the convenience yield. And the convenience yield, it turns out, on average over the last 100 years or so, has been quite substantial. But what we're interested in here is, did it change when the Fed started doing QE? And so if you like Sudoku, uh, you should like this next part, because you'll basically see it's like a little puzzle of figuring out you know, what data do you have, which components can you learn about. So the equations here are the same as before. Uh, in terms of what we have data for, we have data for the yields on the left-hand side. We have some data for the expected average short rates from Fed funds futures. Uh, we also have some data on the default risk of corporate bonds from corporate credit default swaps. And so you can see from the corporate bond line, you can learn the duration risk component. Once you have that, you can learn the treasury convenience shield, you can learn the prepayment risk. So you can see it's like Sudoku, you fill one in and you get the other one and then you can work the whole thing out. Remember what we're particularly interested in is that whether QE works through general channels, the blue one that affects all the bonds, or the duration risk that affects all the bonds, or it works uh, more or partially through these specific components, the last terms, that are specific to a given kind of bonds. If the latter is case, if the latter is the case, then crucially it matters what you buy because buying a treasury is going to partly just lower the treasury yields. Whereas if you bought something else like an MBS, 
that may have a larger impact than the private sector in BSU. So how did it turn out in practice? Okay, so this is a huge literature, so at the risk of summarizing everything in one table, you know, here are a few key numbers that give you some intuitions. So this is evidence on the cumulative change in yields on various bonds um, on a set of event days for quantitative easing round one, two, and three. Those were those increases in the balance sheet that I showed you before when the Fed's balance sheet went up a lot more than it went down. There's been many rounds of QE that we can study. Okay, so look at the first column, the number 81 basis points that says that across a set of five announcement dates for QE1, the BAA rated corporate bonds went down about 80 basis points. Now, a lot of that was a reduction in credit risk. You can see in the minus 40 basis point number that credit default swaps fell substantially on these same days. So from this, we can back out that the expected average short rate plus duration risk component was down about 40, 41 basis points. Okay, so then keeping going with our Sudoku, the treasury yields were down about 107 basis points. If uh, 41 basis points of that was due to the short rate and duration risk, that leaves a large chunk for the treasury convenience yield, which went down by, so we went up by 66 basis points, basically because the Fed bought a bunch of treasuries, it made them scarce, it pushed up the price. Okay. Similarly, we can back out that the MBS prepayment risk component was also substantial. So in other words, the specific components matter. And that's exactly what we saw again in QE2 and QE3. And those are actually easier to interpret because there the Fed only bought one thing. So in QE1, it had bought both MBS and treasuries. QE2 was only treasuries and QE3 only mortgage-backed securities. And if you look at the other two columns, you see for QE2, the treasury yields move the most. They bought treasuries, they move the convenience yield. For QE3, the MBS yields move the most. So in other words, the key lesson from this is that the specific channels matter, and therefore it does matter what you buy. And it, you know, I was very pleased to see that the Fed, having only bought treasuries in QE2, switched to only buying mortgage-backed securities in QE3. Of course, at the time I was not working for the Fed. I don't know if we had anything to do with that, uh, making this point at the time, but uh, you know, hopefully a little. All right. So. Now you may wonder, is the treasury convenience yield even still relevant? We've had lots of increases in the US debt to GDP. Perhaps money demand for treasuries is saturated. The answer, it turns out, is actually surprisingly no. And that's partly because there has been a demand shift for treasuries, because the Fed is buying so many treasuries. Also, foreigners are buying many more treasuries than they were before the financial crisis. So the treasury convenience yield is still a relevant thing. I tried to summarize this by graphing to the right both the total debt to GDP in the US and the total debt to GDP minus the part that's held by the Fed and the foreigners, uh, which as you can see in the left picture have massively increased their holdings since the financial crisis. And what you get out of this is that while there's 100% debt to GDP, half of that is held by the Fed and the foreigners. That's a new thing. And so the demand has shifted out. And that's, I think, the reason that if you graph out that same picture that I had before, in the top right, if you add the points after the financial crisis, you see them lying above the line because of that outward shift of demand. So in other words, what I've just described is still relevant. Uh, we still should worry about the treasury convenience yield. And so I have a little bit of time left. I want to just take up about 10 minutes. Okay, so then uh, let me then talk about both the reserve convenience yield and the treasury convenience yield kind of at the same time, because that it turns out is going to be tightly linked to the current quantitative tightening debate. So both at the ECB and at the Fed, there's lots of discussions of how much can and should we con contract the balance sheet sizes. There's many arguments being put, put forward. I've already given you one. I've said we don't want another September 19 where you see a huge spike in the short market interest rate. So we, we don't want to get down to the point of the reserve demand curve where there's a lot of curvature. We estimated this out. I gave a number. I'm sure the ECB is calculating similar numbers. 
So that's one angle that leads you towards saying we shouldn't do all that much QT because we kind of want supply to stay you know, much higher than it was before the financial crisis because that basically, it, it ensures that interest rates are not very volatile. Another consideration though is convenience yields. So remember that when I said, what do central banks do? They had sort of three jobs. There was the payments, the monetary policy, and then financial stability. What if we went back to basic and said, what would the payments mandate tell us to do? Well, they would tell us to supply as, as much money as people would need. There's a slight twist to this though, which is how do the central banks supply money? Right? They had some liabilities, that was the money, but they also need to hold some assets. So if, for example, the ECB supplied money by buying only German bonds, at the same time, it would be adding liquidity through its liabilities, but subtracting liquidity available to everyone else by buying the bonds. Same thing if the Fed supplies reserves by buying US treasuries. So in a second, I'm gonna think about the central bank's trade-off uh, and how that guides the feasible amounts of quantitative tightening. Other arguments that you hear a lot is, well, maybe large balance sheets are problematic because they have all kinds of side effects. Now, the, the side effects stem from the fact that, remember for the banks, the reserves are an asset. So if the banks are to hold more reserves, they need to either hold fewer of some other assets or they need to just grow and have more liabilities. Okay, so this could, if the, if the banks hold the reserves by reducing their actual lending to non-financial firms, that's obviously bad, especially in the European context where you know, banks are very special and important. And so that there's evidence for this in the US context um, that this is a potentially an important side effect of having a large balance sheet. On the other hand, if the, if the central bank's QE means that the banks issue more deposits, uh, this, you know, of course, generate valuable deposits, but it also generates financial instability, especially if these are uninsured deposits, you know, as we saw in the recent, uh, in the recent crisis with some of the regional banks in the US. A final consideration is central bank profits. Um, if the central bank has a large balance sheet and interest rates go up, the central bank is losing a lot of money as you know, we have around various central banks. And this could be a threat to central bank independence. And therefore, central banks might want to shrink their balance sheet a bunch in good times so that they can ramp them up later if they need to because the economy falls into a slump. Okay, so there's many considerations, but let me zoom in on this convenience maximization approach. And sorry, I need just one slide of a few expressions, but hopefully they by now should look pretty familiar. So uh, suppose we wanted to maximize the private sector's convenience from both reserves and uh, from convenient bonds, it being, let's take the US case, uh, where the convenient bonds are treasuries. So then the convenience from reserves is the red term here, and the convenience from treasuries is the blue term. The key thing is, what is the central bank decide to do in terms of its holding of convenience bonds. That's the BCB there. So the private sector holds the total supply B minus the bonds BCB that's held by the central bank. Now we can distinguish two cases. The first one, which maps to how the ECB historically worked where they supplied reserves by lending to banks, probably not an asset that's particularly safe or liquid. So uh, the ECB then, was setting the BCB equal to zero. It didn't hold any German bonds. And it would then maximize the private sector convenience by setting the convenience yield and the balance sheet cost to zero. Contrast that with a case where, think of the Fed supplying reserves by buying treasuries. In that case, you have to worry about both terms because they're linked. So they're linked by the Fed's balance sheet. I put a very simple balance sheet there that says the Fed's treasury holdings BCB is equal to its liabilities, the reserves plus the autonomous factors. Plug that into the expression at the top, and you can see basically if the Fed picks a bigger balance sheet, that increases the red part. It provides more liquidity through, more convenience through the reserves, but it takes a very val valuable treasuries for the private sector to hold, and thus reduces the blue part. And if you do a little math, you can figure out that the optimal thing then to do from the perspective of supply and convenience is to supply you know, to increase the Fed's balance sheet to the point that the two are equal. 
So let me just make one comment about, you know, the ECB currently has an ongoing uh, discussion of what assets should it hold, how large should the balance sheet be in, in a new steady state sense. And uh, at the ECB, there's some talk that potentially they could supply reserves with a mix of bank lending and also a portfolio of government bonds. Then what would this prescribe? Well, then the ECB should just set the convenience yield on reserves equal to the average convenience yield on its assets. So suppose, for example, for simplicity, that only German bonds had a convenience yield, then the average convenience yield on the ECB's portfolio would be the convenience yield on bonds times the portfolio rate of bonds in the ECB portfolio, which would be a, fa a function of the ECB's portfolio rate on bonds, omega, and what fraction of those bonds are German bonds. So the, the framework would apply uh, in that case as well. So just to give you some intuitions, uh, let me just remind you of the reserve market diagram that we had from before uh, to, dis to describe uh, this, uh, this optimality result for case A and then I'll get to case B. So where exactly is the convenience shield from reserves in this picture? So it turns out that it's just the area under the demand curve down to the interest rate on reserves. Okay. So to focus on that, let me just change the y-axis to subtract out the interest rate on reserves. Then you get the left picture here. And now, suppose that you wanted to maximize this area to maximize welfare. This is exactly the same as if you maximize the welfare from supplying milk or whatever. You keep supplying until the last unit is not valuable. Uh, and that optimality is, is illustrated to the right, you get a pretty large optimal balance sheet. Now contrast that with the case B where the central bank uh, supplies reserves by buying convenient bonds. There you end up with a much smaller optimal balance sheet. The figures now look a little bit more messy because I need both a picture for the reserves market. That was the red part in the mouth. And then I need a picture for the convenient bond market. That's the picture here to the right. And in this case, the optimality just says you should equalize the convenience yield. Perfect. So now let's think about the specifics of the Fed versus CECB and try to estimate some of this out in the data. Now you can see from a convenience supply perspective, it's much preferable to be in case A. Right? That way you are supplying liquidity through your liabilities at central bank without taking away anything convenient from the private sector to hold. However, the central bank's asset choice is not, as you know, driven by convenience maximization. A lot of it is politics. So let me give you a few quotes from the Fed and for the ECB so you can see the politics involved. So the Fed has announced that it plans to hold mainly treasuries in the longer run to minimize its effect on the allocation of credit across sectors. So the, the sentiment that the Fed should mostly hold treasuries uh, is really a sentiment that anything else is kind of messing with the economy. I put a quote here from uh, Broaddus and Goodfriend where they say, the Fed's asset acquisition policy ought to give priority to preserving public support for the Fed's independence by staying out of disputes for, regarding credit allocation. And if they, just buy treasuries, Basically, they leave all the fiscal decisions to Congress and Treasury. Okay, this is going to sound very different from how this works out in the euro area. So you can see in the US, the safe thing to buy is Treasuries. Anything else is messing with the economy. In the euro area, it's the opposite, right? Here, buy anything other than sovereign bonds and people are okay. If you buy sovereign bonds, then you're messing, there's fiscal dominance. Long story short, I'm gonna not read the whole Isabel Schnabel quote, but you have probably heard something similar. All right, so that means that the Fed is stuck in case B, where it's gonna supply reserves with treasuries. The ECB could get back to the way the ECB used to work and supply reserves by lending to banks or, um, being in the, in the advantageous case, uh, you know, thereby being in the, in the advantageous case where it's not subtracting convenience on the asset side. So just to wrap up with a couple of numbers of how this works out, uh, we already know how to calculate the solution for case A. That was the one where we just maximize the convenience from reserves. Uh, 
we have already estimated the reserve demand. I've shown you the graph. The point at which this hits zero is about 3.3 trillion. Uh, but the Fed, of course, cannot be in case A because of the politics of the US. So in case B, let me just show the number. Uh, I estimate that the convenience yield on treasuries and reserves would be equalized for a balance sheet size a bit less than a trillion at convenience yields of 30 basis points. Now, if you show this to Fed people, they would say, oh, oh my God, 30 basis points, that's so much higher than any convenience yield we have seen in recent history, where the Fed funds IOR spread has been negative. And then I had to remind them that, you know, the ECB used to do just fine when it had reserve scarcity of 100 basis point, you know, with some interest rate volatility. So 29% is not really a radical number. You know, it's just a third of how the, how the ECB used to work. But nonetheless, I suspect expect that the Fed people would still be somewhat anxious with the prescription here. For the ECB, focusing on case A, I repeat the estimation of the reserve demand curve and then calculate out that the ECB would maximize its convenience supply with a liquidity supply of about 1.4 trillion. Um, it does matter that the ECB doesn't have to hold German bonds. The German bonds still have a convenience yield. It's, if you measure relative to the KFW bonds, it varies a bit across maturities, but it's, it's around 40 basis points. So if you try to do case B for the ECB, you do get a substantially smaller balance sheet. Okay, so let me just conclude. This is the same slide as we started out with, just now that you kind of understand the moving parts uh, with the details filled in. So as you can see, um, money is all about convenience yield, people hold money at low interest rate because of the convenience yield. There's many different convenience yields involved. There's the one on cash, the one on government deposits, and central banks generally will try to satisfy that by supplying uh, their convenience elastically, and that's very consistent with their payments objective. Moving to the convenience yield on reserves, we can see that shapes the reserve demand curve, and that tells the central bank how to hit its target. We had a chart of how to set the interest rate and reserves to make sure that the market clears at the targeted interest rate. I had was the example with the 4% interest rate. Uh, the convenience yield and reserves was also crucial for quantitative tightening because the shape of the reserve demand curve determined where do you start getting curvature, where might you see spikes in interest rates. Then I turned to the convenience yield on, on treasuries. I argued that it shapes treasury demand. And I emphasize that because of that, if a central bank just buys convenient bonds in quantitative easing, that's not going to be as effective per dollar purchased as buying um, other pri as buying private sector assets because it's probably just moving the treasury convenience yield. Finally, I gave an argument for equalizing convenience yield across reserves and treasuries, and I want to emphasize that this is not something that the central bank can always do. Uh, remember, the whole reason we got into quantitative easing was that we hit the effective lower bound, and therefore we needed to use the balance sheet to simulate the economy. At that time, you should just completely forget about my convenience maximization argument because you really need the balance sheet to stimulate the economy. But now we're in a different world, right? Now there's inflation, we are trying to tighten. There's no upper bound on how high you can take the short interest rate. So now basically you can use the interest rate and reserve to tighten policy. This gives you one more degree of freedom. Now you can do something else with your balance sheet. And I'm arguing that one argument would be to go back to basics, think about the payments objective and supplying uh, convenient assets. So lots of different convenience yields involved. I hope some of this, some of the charts help, even those who are not in monetary economics uh, get some, some intuitions for how this works. Thank you for this excellent lecture. Uh, we have uh, about half an hour, if we can go a few minutes. Take notes. Oh, sorry. This is a bit ahead of the class. So we are ready for collecting questions. The governor, I guess, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
is the only one. I guess I have to break the ice and let me uh, uh, do it by uh, thanking uh, Professor Vissing uh, Jorgensen, dear Annette, for uh, a very interesting uh, lecture on a burning issue for global central banks and investors, the size of the balance sheet. I'm sure that many of the economists and central bankers which are in, who are in this room and those who are following remotely will, uh, will uh, uh, reflect uh, on, your, uh, on your lecture. Um, I have two questions. The first one is on the role of, of the convenience yield as a determinant of the size of the balance sheet. In your model, the, 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 the central bank defines the supply of reserves and the amount of assets it buys uh, in order to uh, reach the optimality condition of equalizing the convenience yields across uh, reserves and government bonds. Uh, and this is fine. But uh, uh, as you know, the size of the central bank, the, of the balance sheet of the central bank, is also a fundamental tool um, in the implementation of monetary policy, especially in, in this uh, uh, moment in which many central banks are moving from the old uh, corridor system to a floor system. Uh, certainly the ECB is doing it, is moving towards a corridor, uh, a floor system. And this implies a much larger uh, volume of reserves, a much larger balance sheet. So uh, how should I think about your, uh, your model? It's something which has to be considered in addition to this operational uh, uh, framework and to the implications of the operational frameworks for the size of, of uh, the, cent the balance sheet of the central bank. A related question is on the role of government, because you have two, uh, two securities that contribute to reaching the uh, optimality condition. One is the, research, the reliability of the central bank, reserves, and another one is the liability of the government, government bonds. So why should the central bank be in charge of reaching the optimality conditions? Why shouldn't you get there, you know, for example, suppose the central bank is uh, doing a QE and then withdraws too many uh, government bonds from the market so that the, the optimality conditions is not available. Why should you not have the government intervening and issuing more bonds? And, this has also an implication for the uh, possible, unintended, and co of course, undesirable consequences of your framework. Suppose that the government knows that the, the, the central bank has incentives to reach this optimality condition by equalizing the convenience yields across the two securities, then it would have an incentive to issue bonds because it knows that the central bank would issue reserves to withdraw that excess supply of bonds is this a desirable implication? Of course, the answer is no. For uh, uh, monetary policy coming from your framework, and uh, can you tell us on other possible um, undesirable, unintended consequences, I would call them risks, uh, from the application, from the possible application of your framework for monetary policy implementation? Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so I completely agree with your first argument that you know central banks have decided to be in the ample reserves regime and that was why my starting point was in the work with Lopez Salido to calculate you know where the reserves stop being ample that was the interest rate volatility at the angle that I argued when I discussed about the September 19. so I think that should be a first consideration for the balance sheet but I, I do want to emphasize that all the other things that I laid out all the other arguments about convenience maximization, the side effects of large balance sheet, and the problematic effect of central bank losses on independence. Those are additional considerations that may lead you towards wanting to have a smaller balance sheet. And so, as I said at the end, um, it's not that I'm arguing we should go back to 100 basis point scarcity or even hundreds of basis point scarcity, but maybe just I want to nudge the debate a little bit tighter than people would have gotten from just the interest rate volatility angle. And, I was struck, I went to a BIS meeting recently where all the people who were in the room with people in tar charge of there not being interest rate spikes, and they all agreed we should just have a very large balance sheet. But of course, all the companies who may not get a loan because their bank is holding reserves instead of loans, you know, they were not in the room. Had they been there too, they would say, okay, guys, can we shrink things just a little bit so I can get some funding here? So 
So I'm, you know, there's many different angles, and I want to notch the debate a little bit tighter. Um, in terms of the argument about government bonds, I think, you know, I deliberately have taken the government bond supply as constant. Um, you know, if you ask the Germans or the US taxpayers, you know, why do you even have such a small supply that there's a convenience yield? Why don't you just issue some more bonds? I suspect they would say, well, it's not free to keep things convenient. Right? In order for the default risk to be really low, it means that even when it's painful, you have to be willing to tax or cut spending. And so there's a cost to expanding the supply. And that's why I decided to optimize given the, the total supply. But your point is well taken that some coordination could be helpful. For example, um, I put a result in a paper. I haven't talked about government maturity structure here in the debate about whether the government should issue bills or longer maturity bonds. It turns out that for given government bond supply, what you should do is you should change the mix of bills and bonds to equalize all the convenience yields. So the reserve convenience yield is equal to the bill convenience yield is equal to the bond convenience yield. So that's a productive kind of coordination that you can do without um, increasing the overall government bond supply. So thank you very much for your presentation. I have a clarification question on uh, case A versus case B in the quantitative tightening. And the question is whether you can elaborate a bit more on the differences between these two cases regarding the bank lending channel. You, you mentioned something along those lines and the application you know, to bank lending to companies and if you can elaborate a bit more, thank you. Let me, let me collect a few, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, a question on, in, in, on your model on convenience yield. Uh, your model is based, as you've shown, on a vertical supply curve for reserve, and then you have to decide where to put it, estimating the optimal amount of reserve. Uh, my question is, hasn't the global financial crisis suggested the opportunity to move to a wholly different model, operational model, in which you have a vertical uh, supply line for reserves at the policy interest rate, i.e. a standing facility in which all reserve demand is satisfied uh, at the policy interest rates, which uh, would, uh, one could guess, imply that you always satisfy the need for reserves in the system without having to engage in complicated estimation of convenience yields because that would be endogenously uh, implemented by market participants. So uh, what would you think about what the crisis told us on the optimal model for supplying reserves? Let me just take those two. So, um, but in terms of the case A versus case B, uh, the case where the central bank issues reserves by lending to banks would correspond to case B under the thinking that lending bank loans are not a particularly safe or liquid investment. And so that's why I argued that the ECB could get back to predominantly being in that case. Uh, with regard to your question about the standing facilities, as far as I'm saying, the Bank of England's framework, new framework fits quite well in that category where they supply the amount of reserves that the banks want at a given interest rate. Uh, the argument you'd hear in, in the debate about why that could be undesirable would be uh, first that the central bank then completely loses control over the size of its balance sheet. This may or may not be something that you're concerned about. The other one uh, is that you get no market signals from the interbank market, which would then, you know, simply just shut down. And so you know, there's a debate and central banks don't agree about whether that's a valuable thing, but across some central banks, um, there has been an effort to try to have reserves tiering and other systems where you can get some interbank trading. Um, but that's a little bit of, of a debate about whether that's, a, that's an important argument. Those are the two main ones I've heard sort of against that system. Thank you. Thank you for a 
extremely interesting presentation. Uh, two points. One is a follow-up on uh, what the governor has said before, and you, your answer that some uh, coordination, some e that there is an issue of coordination between the um, government and central bank, uh, which leaves me thinking that there is also an issue of incentives. So uh, coordination is fine as long as the incentives are aligned, and this is not entirely clear, I mean, in the, in the case you, that you mentioned. But the other, the other question is a kind of a, a something that a bit puzzles me a bit in, in, in your model, because the uh, convenience, as you define it, is not the only reason why the demand for some assets might be uh, might go beyond consideration of risks and, and return. Uh, you may have a more generally liquidity premium, but that's that's very similar. But you have other things like, for instance, preferred habitat for long term for long term long dated bonds. In the case because of um, business models or because of of uh, of um, supervisory requirements for insurance, for instance. And another thing, slightly different but not totally different, is green bonds. Again, there is the greenium is another issue, another reason why you might want to hold a certain uh, securities beyond consideration of risks and return. So, I mean, since the, 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 your framework um, goes to uh, having some prescriptions in, in terms of size and composition of the, of the, of the bank's, bank's balance sheet, how do all these other uh, types of uh, you know, differences between um, demand given only by uh, return and re risk and return consideration and uh, actual demand. How do, do do all these potential other cases? It's not, I mean, it doesn't seem to be a, a sort of black and white, uh, either convenient or inconvenient asset. There, there is a host of possible reasons or possible qualifications. That, how does that, uh, how would that uh, fit into your framework? Yeah, let me just turn to that right away. So the, uh, those are great comments. The, the convenience field can incorporate many different things. I emphasize safety and liquidity, but any sort of green premium and so forth could also be in there. Um, your comment about preferred habits that I think actually fits quite well into the framework in the sense that um, there could, you know, that fits into the safety category. So if you think about like, why might a pension fund want to hold, you know, normally risk-free bonds of a given maturity, well, because they have liabilities maturing at that date. So then you could think of there as sort of a whole schedule of safety premium. But this is fine. You know, you can measure convenience yields at different maturities, and then you could think about equalizing them across the maturities. Um, with respect to the greenium, you know, suppose that you thought about the, the convenience yield and something that both safe, liquid, and has um, climate benefit. Then in the market, those bonds should be trading at an even lower interest rate than treasuries. And so if the central bank was to include those in the portfolio, you could, in, you, you know, you could incorporate uh, all those effects where all the convenience yields incorporate these additional welfare benefits. And so at the margin, the central bank should hold green bonds and treasury bonds and so forth up to the point where the, the convenience yields are each equalized. And so, there, so I think there is a prescription. Uh, just like they should equalize the convenience yields and bills and bonds, they could have, there could be different kinds of government bonds, the not green ones and the green ones, and they could equalize those as well. Thanks a lot for uh, the interesting talk. Uh, I learned a lot personally. Um, and I have a question. So, can you comment on uh, so whether today the central banks uh, in managing these convenience yields they uh, they are facing higher stakes? Uh, because in principle, you can think of uh, competition coming from the private sector in providing uh, supplying uh, alternative uh, assets like you know, cryptocurrencies or uh, digital currencies. Uh, and so, managing these convenience yields are particularly important uh, given the technologies. Thank you. Yes, uh, I will go back a little bit at the last part of your presentation. So 
let's assume that you, you, you are in a world where you provide liquidity not only through outright purchases, but also through lending facilities. So in that world, I suppose what is relevant for the convenience yield is not anymore interest on reserve, as it was in the first part, but is the amplitude of the difference between different facilities. So the deposit facility and the facility to which you provide liquidity. This is the first thing. And the second thing, uh, I think that is all, also very relevant in that world, the policy on the higher cut. So the central bank actually can affect the, what you call conveniency, I would call it pledgeability, premium, by changing the higher cut. And this is especially relevant in, in Europe where different government bonds could have different higher cuts. Uh, yeah, let me just take those two. So in terms of uh, private competition and supply and convenience, you know, it, I think it's a good thing if the private sector is able to supply convenient assets as, 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 as well. But empirically, the private sector is, is good at supplying convenient short-term assets. You know, there's lots of repo contracts. There's, you know, highly rated commercial paper may probably be convenient. Where the government has an advantage is really at supplying convenient long-term assets because the government has the ability to tax to repay its obligations. If you look at the total amount of AAA rated corporate bonds outstanding, I mean, there's maybe a handful of bonds. And, and so I view the private sector as a helpful, you know, supplement, not as necessarily competing. We want all the convenience that we can get. Um, in terms of your uh, comment uh, regarding the facilities, what happens is if there's take up at the central bank's ceiling facility, that sort of caps the interest rates from going too high. It also caps the convenience shields from going too high. So it's actually still the difference between whatever the market rate is and the IOR that captures convenience. But it's a man the convenience is then managed not just through through the standard channels, but also through the facility. So I think that's fine. I completely agree with your comment that uh, I left out an important tool, which is the collateral framework. This is something that comes up more in the European context, because in the Fed context, there's very little reserves issue. You know, the discount window take up is tiny. So the collateral rules at the Fed are not that important. Whereas here, of course, it's a huge deal, you know, and there's good work on identifying the effect of changes to the collateral framework. Ask a question since there's been there is one element that is important here, which is the international dimension of convenience yield, the, the currency aspect. There is plenty of evidence of uh, convenience in the dollar, and a convenience in the dollar and the treasury convenience in the dollar and you know bonds and, and equities relative to other currencies. And there is also evidence that uh, especially long-term treasury, five to ten years, relative to the G7, the convenience of the U.S. Treasuries has gone down, which is completely consistent with an internal convenience yield. So I just wonder uh, uh, if you have any thought on this, also in relation to the instruments of monetary policy with the growth of swap lines that in this respect have become practice, uh, uh, very much actively used and clearly related to the stability and the convenience of different assets. So you're more of an expert on the international aspect than I, but let me give it a try. So, um, you know, over the past uh, few weeks, you may have followed the, there was a huge increase in the term premium on the treasuries. Then it came back down and there was a lot of discussion about the U.S. fiscal outlook. And if you look at the fundamentals, you know, some of the fundamentals that the U.S. deficit, you know, makes us look about the same as Italy, probably. So... There's lots of discussion of whether the treasury is sort of falling out of favor. And my prior would be that at 100% debt to GDP, that, you know, like there's, that we should have, we should have satisfied the, the convenience demand. And especially if the fiscal outlook is we're going to go to 100 and some percent, you would say in a forward looking way, but we would expect it to go to zero. This all, you know, the reason it hasn't happened yet, as I laid out, was because of the Fed's large demand shock for treasuries as well as the foreigners. So a lot is going to hinge on. What did the foreigners decide to do in their treasury holdings? What does the Fed decide to do in, in its treasury holding? Uh, those are key factors in addition, of course, to the, you know, the U.S. fiscal outlook, which is going to depend a lot on how the next election turns out and so forth. Come back to the fiscal and monetary interaction and the blurring of the borders between uh, 
the two policies. Any other questions? In uh, some of your charts, uh, you showed uh, us uh, uh, fairly uh, precisely, apparently, estimated demand curves. In other charts, there were data points that were tracing back to the 40s, if I, if I saw it correctly. So uh, when you come to the prescriptions uh, you know, for the ECB, that is the right amount of, uh, of the balance sheet for the moment, how robust would that is to some of the issues that have already been uh, been uh, mentioned on 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 the, on the part of the treasury taking you know taking policies so one type or another to uh, technological innovation uh, and the like. One of the reasons you gave for convenience is uh, uh, for reserves, for instance, is the ability to help uh, banks uh, uh, work in the payment system. But back in uh, in 2007, we already had our TGS or uh, worldwide. Uh, they were not there in uh, uh, prior to the 80s, and uh, the system was working very well with uh, negligible excess reserves. So, how robust is uh, this prescription now? Maybe a year or two it could hold, but maybe you know going forward, this this whole thing, if you take it to prescriptive. Uh, uh, measures could collapse or would force the central bank to chase, uh, you know, an ever changing uh, uh, demand uh, curve. Yeah, thanks for that comment. So, um, I went through the, the estimation detail quickly. So, I completely agree with your point that we want to emphasize that the reserve demand and treasury demand should be estimated over a period in which they are stable. And so, the reserve demand estimation is done from 2009 onwards due to the financial crisis potentially changing the reserve demand both in terms of banks' perception of how many reserves they need, but also in terms of these balance sheet costs. You know, changes to capital requirements, for example, would change my little balance sheet cost parameter, which would shift the reserve demand. And if you actually extend it backwards, which I have, there is a shift in the reserve demand curve. There's a lot of debate currently about whether the, liqui the liquidity coverage ratio is causing changes to reserve demand. There's also super biases that are being you know, there's some suggestion that they're making the banks hold more reserves than they really need, and there's all kinds of reasons. So I actually was quite skeptical that we could find a reserve demand curve that looked at all stable, even past 2009, because there's all kinds of changes. It turns out that, you know, we find something pretty stable once we control for the size of the banking sector, and we can sort of only hope that it keeps being reasonably stable going forward. But this is not sure, right? I mean, when you had the SVB crisis, you see reserve demand shifting out to some extent. It's shifted now back in. There are some high frequency fluctuations. But yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I was surprised to find something at all stable. And for treasury demand, you really need a lot of data. You know, reserves moves around quite a bit at high frequency because you have QE1, then you have QE2, QE3, you have QT. You know, there's the central bank causes variation in reserve supply. That's great for estimating stuff, even on a pretty short sample. The Treasury, you saw the debt to GDP is like way up in the Second World War, and then down. There's some, it's much more slow moving. So to have any hope on doing this, we went back actually to 1919 in order to have enough data to get some reasonable T stats. And again, there, you know, the picture has become quite famous, partly because I think also in that context, no one expected us to find a reasonably stable demand function. Uh, but, you know, apparently it looks pretty stable until you have the demand shock from the Fed as well as the foreigners. And so uh, there's actually now in asset pricing a very a recent literature, a lot of it's spearheaded by uh, Cohen and Yogo, that try to estimate, it is called demand-based asset pricing, but they try to estimate demands for all kinds of stuff by various groups. So that's one of the most active uh, areas actually in asset pricing currently. Questions? Timing. No question. So I guess we should thank again Professor Annette uh, for this uh, lecture and uh, hopefully we'll uh, see some of the lines of research and application of these ideas uh, soon uh, in the practical uh, activity of central banks. So thank you very much. Man.